can be seated. Students, you can be dismissed with Pastor Jesse for your time in the Student Center tonight. I want to invite everyone to take your text in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. I know last week we made a diversion from our expositional study, but I believe the Lord blessed it in a mighty, mighty way. First time in 30-something years of preaching I ever preached out of a baptistry, I can promise you that. And it was a beautiful time, and the Lord used it to set a lot of people free in, in the house and online. Let me make a quick announcement about this weekend, not Sunday. Sunday is our regular scheduled service. On Friday night, we have another one of these beautiful 24 hours under the tent of worship and prayer with Brother Bowman and his family. And so, listen, I want you to be a part of that. It's a stay all night or stay as long as you can. So pop in, pop out, read the word, pray, and uh, just press in. There'll be a lot of requests here. And so that'll start uh, on Friday night at 9 o'clock right here in the tent. But it will run into and culminate with something that we have going on in the tent on Saturday night, and that begins at 6 o'clock. Am I right on that? At 6 o'clock, we are celebrating the one-year anniversary of GV Espanol. Amen? So I want many of you, and I know a lot of you will be driving in this weekend for Sunday, and you're like, what do I do on Saturday? You come celebrate with us for GV Espanol from 6 to 8 o'clock, and uh, I'm going to have the privilege of preaching that night, and it's going to be through interpretation. So you don't want to miss that because uh, you want to see if I can give them a run for their money and just preach, 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 and see if they can keep up with me. Amen? So it's going to be good. So 6 o'clock on Saturday night, come celebrate with us Global Vision Espanol. Friday at 9 o'clock, we begin our worship and 24 hours of prayer, so don't miss out on that. Well, I want to pray, and then I, I just want to take my time tonight for a few moments, and I want to get back into Ephesians 5, and we'll get through as many verses as we possibly can. This is not going to be exhaustive tonight. It's going to be as exhaustive as I can give you in an amount of Bible study time that we have together in a midweek. But we literally could, could take weeks and months uh, just to formulate and understand this passage. And, of course, through our marriage ministry and things that we have coming down the pike with all of that, so much more will be said. I know uh, my wife and Kelsey last week in the tent for The Secret Place and then last night online for The Secret Place, they've been talking a lot about intimacy in marriage. And so tonight... We're going to deal with the biblical aspect of what it looks like in your marriage between a husband and a wife when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? And the fullness of the Holy Spirit should drastically, dramatically affect your marriage. Does that make sense? That's why it's in the context. That's why it's in the setting of be filled with the Spirit, and then here's the results. And the results are your marriage, because if I want to know if you are spirit-filled, all I have to do is ask your spouse. All I have to do is ask your children. I can ask you, and of course the answer would be, well, yeah, of course. No, 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 let me ask your spouse. Let me ask your husband or wife. And I intend for the next few moments for it probably to be as quiet as it just was when I said that. <laughs> because uh, these are some convicting areas that we have to deal with. So let's pray. And we're going to jump right into the word of the Lord. And fellas, if you just give me a little bit more monitor to keep me up in the house a little bit. My voice is still a little bit raw. Father, thank you tonight for the privilege of being in church. And Lord, we count it as a privilege. Lord, this is not some tacked on service in the middle of the week. Lord, this is a privilege to gather with your people in your place around your word so we can be like your son. So tonight, conform us into the image of Christ. Take Greg Locke out of the equation and fill me with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And may the power and the influence of the Word of God convict us deeply, motivate us to righteousness, but change us forever. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, <coughs> go back if you would please to verse number 18. We're going to work our way down just for a moment. In verse 18, Paul says, and be not drunk with wine. There was the command, but we're in his excess. But be filled, dominated, dictated, controlled by, be filled with the Spirit. And then he tells us the results. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. We preached on that. 
Then we preached on giving thanks always because thankfulness is a direct result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So criticism and grouchiness is a result of not being filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I get a witness right there? He says in verse 21, submitting yourselves. He's talking to the body of Christ. It's before he gets into the context of marriage. You see, he's not just talking about husbands and wives submitting to each other in their submission to the Lord, but mutually the church in submission one to another because my responsibility is to restore you and meet your needs and your responsibility is to restore me, meet my needs. And the Bible says that we are to seek the advancement of others more than ourselves, And we can only do that when we submit to each other in the fear of God, right? So we preached a whole message on that. But then we stopped for just a little while in verse 22. It's as far as we got. And some of you were like, oh, thank the Lord. Well, buckle in. Because this is a result of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He begins with the wives. But, but fellas, I want to make sure that, that, you don't, that you don't doze off because there's more to the men to their wives than there is from the wives to the husbands. But he begins with them for a predominant reason. We're going to see that. Notice this. Wives. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now, I'm slowing down on purpose tonight. This Wednesday night, we got to study the Bible together. If you're ready to learn something, shout amen. amen. Notice, he does not say, women, submit to men. Okay, that's not a caveman teaching in the Bible. He does never ever tell a woman to submit to a man. He tells a wife to submit to her husband. And then he says, unto her own husband. Unto her own husband. Now, we quickly mentioned this, and so I'll, I'll not unpackage this. But look, if, if ladies, if you have a husband and you have, and you do, a pastor, do you know what you do not do? You do not submit to my leadership over your husband's leadership. Shout amen in this house. That's a problem in the body of Christ. You submit to your own husband, not to another person's husband. You don't give more reverence to your boss than you do your husband and then expect God to bless your marriage the way biblically it should be blessed. Wives, if your Holy Ghost field, you will submit unto your own husbands. Now watch this. Here's a very interesting phrase, as unto the Lord. You ever notice that submission and obedience be it in a husband and wife, be it in children, be it in servants and masters, you will always notice that phrase, as unto the Lord, is used. Because if anybody wants you to submit to sin, witchcraft, and rebellion, it's better to obey God rather than man. So he is not saying if your husband wants you to sin, you have to go along with it. He's saying if your husband is striving to be filled with the Holy Ghost, then even if you don't like the decision, you need to go along with it. And so he's not justifying him getting away with asking you to do sinful things. What he's justifying is that sometimes, ladies, I know this is going to be difficult, but take a big swallow right now. You ready for this? Sometimes... The most spiritual thing you can do as a discerning wife is let your husband make a mistake so he can learn from it. Okay, he didn't marry a chainsaw. Stop. You married him knowing full well what you was getting into, and if you spend the rest of your life trying to change him, you are not in submission in a godly manner to your husband. Let God change him because you can't change him. And if you did change him, eventually you'd want to rechange him. I'll tell you a phenomenon that I found in this church. I wasn't going to say this, but it sounds good. And by the way, it's not just in this church. It's, it's across the board. But we've seen this happen a number of times. I, I bet you if I went back in the archives and I counted them up, I bet you 18 or 20 times this has happened in our church. A woman's like, oh, pastor, church, pray for my husband. He needs to get born again. Pray for him, get saved, get baptized. Pray for my husband to get right with God. And she prays and prays, and she means it. And then he gets saved, and she can't stand him. He gets born again, and she leaves him. He starts going to church, and he becomes a Jesus fanatic, and she can't handle that. You better be careful what you pray for. You can't change anybody, but the gospel can change everybody. So wives... Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Why? Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Now, I didn't expect anybody to have a song and a dance on that, but it's the facts. 
this silly society, women's rights, feminism. Feminism has done more to destroy feminism than anything else. Oh, you misogynistic individuals, you believe the Bible, yada, 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 shmada. Yes, we do. The husband is the head of the wife. Get over it. By the way, that does not, if he's spirit-filled, he won't use that as a caveman effect. People are like, well, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want you to preach on things like that because my husband, he'll start taking advantage of it. If he does, he's not filled with the Holy Ghost. A spirit-filled husband will understand his headship. His role as a husband. A spirit-filled wife will understand his headship, his role as a husband. I was watching, uh, I think it was last night, I, I watched these, uh, these Bible channel YouTube. My, my kids are like, what are you always watching? I'm always watching this Moses and Esther stuff. I, I love it, right? And I was watching this one that was about Noah. And it was so cranked up crazy sideways. I'm like, Bible doesn't say that. Bible doesn't say that. Matter of fact, the Bible says the opposite of that. Bible doesn't say that. Sometimes people come up with these spectacular, nonsensical things, right? One of the things that struck me odd was the way that Noah's wife talked to Noah. And I'm like, if you really understood the context of the Old Testament, I promise you Noah's wife was not some smart mouth nag. And Hollywood has, has made it out that, that the Bible is some antiquified book that belongs in chains in the basement of the Vatican because we can't talk about archaic things like the husband is the head of the wife. Oh, yes, we can. We are in a mess in the American church, and our families are a crap fest because we've let everybody else be the head except the one God said is the head. Now, I know that's not popular, but I'm not looking for votes and running for all this even in an election year. I'm telling you what the Bible says. So, wife, you have to allow him to be the head of the house. And dear God, by all means, fellas, rise up and give her a reason to let you be the head of the house. Quit being a mealy-mouthed sissy husband. Okay? Look, I know all of our kids are sold, spoiled, rotten. We can't stand them. I get it. But let me tell you something. Your kids don't run your house. Your kids don't get the final say. Around my place, we call it the golden rule. He didn't make it the gold, make it the rules. Okay? In our house, it's a little different because I make the gold, she makes the rules. But nonetheless, and the kids know that she's really in me, Peter, them children, right? But I'm here to tell you that we have got this headship thing twisted. Matter of fact, it's so much twisted, it's completely rebelled against. Well, let's not talk about things like that. That's just such an archaic thing. No, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, the Bible says the husband is the head of the wife. I'm going to read it one more time. For the husband is the head of the wife. You see, everybody loves John 3, 16, but don't like Ephesians 5, 23. I don't care what the internet says. I don't care what Twitter says. I don't care what CNN says. I don't care what any of them says. I don't care what the church world says. Husband is the head of the wife. He has headship. That's why we said last week or two weeks ago that submission for a lady really is protection. It's ducking so God can bust your husband in the mouth. Because I want to tell you something. Sir, you and I will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and biblically we will give an account as to whether we were proper priests of our home or not. You see, I may pastor you with this microphone from this platform in this tent, but you drive off this parking lot and you are the pastor of your house. You are the pastor of your house. And you will never be treated as the head of your house if you don't take responsibility and act like the head of your house. And by the way, that does not give you a justifiable right to be a jerk about it. Because you will not be a jerk about it if you're truly submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I want to prove that to you. Watch this. Because he's going to give us an as, if you will. Right? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Listen, there's a lot of denominations that are built on bossy deacon boards. Some bossy smoking deacon is not the head of the church. Elders are not the head of the church. The pastor is not the head of the church. But we get anywhere tonight. Man, I feel like I'm preaching across town to Episcopalian church, first of all. He, he says... The husband's the head of the wife, even as, just like, in like manner, the same illustration, analogy, even as Christ is the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. He gets the final say-so. You know what Peter says? We are under shepherds. He's the main shepherd. 
You see, I'm a shepherd, but I'm an under-shepherd. He gets the final vote. He gets the final say. So the wife is to be in subjection to the husband as the church is to be in subjection to Jesus. Watch this. And he is the Savior. Shout Savior. Savior. He is the Savior of the body. Because the Bible says in Acts 20 that Jesus shed his blood for the church. Now, I'm not real smart, but I'm not going to concede that I'm real stupid either, so don't say amen. If Jesus shed his blood for the church, don't you think you ought to be involved in one more than some of you are? Jesus shed his blood for the church. Not so you could sit around on Sunday morning and the sun warms your feet and binge watch Netflix. He died for the church. You ought to be involved in the church. You ought to be involved in the church. And so he said he's the savior of the body. So, fellas, how much of a savior, not salvation-wise, but just practically, how much of a savior to our wife are we really? Are we willing to, as he'll say in a moment, love her as Christ loved the church? There's another as. It means in the same manner. Well, how did he first prove his love to the church? He died for her. I mean, look, I know it's all cute. We say, oh, yes, 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 I love my wife so much I would, I would die for her. Okay, look, I don't want to know if you believe that. I want to know if she believes that. Because you saying it don't impress me. Her knowing it deeply impacts me. Hmm? And deeply impacts her, by the way. And and by the way, you want her to recognize your headship? Let her know you'll take a bullet for her. Hallelujah. (coughs) Where's my chair? Praise God in heaven. Listen, can I talk for a minute? This is beautiful. The Bible says, and we're going to get to verse 25, but the Bible says that, that we are the sa- he's the Savior of the body. So in like manner, we're to be protective saviors, lay down our lives for our spouse, for our wife. That's what a husband does to a wife. We're still on the wives, but I've got I to talk for a minute. I may be old school. I don't know, right? I may be just like super old-fashioned, whatever. I'm probably the most old-fashioned, youngest preacher you've ever met, but... You know what I don't let my, ask her, right? I, I love I can say things like this and I can just be like, yeah. and she'd be like, man, that's true. Yeah, that's true. No, he's a knucklehead there, but yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true, right? She'll correct me when I need correct. <laughs> let me say something. When we walk down the road, it used to be like this all the time. When you walk down a sidewalk, what kind of man lets his wife walk on the side when the, when the cars can roll up on the curb and run plumb over. Unless you're hoping for something. Oh, I need some release. Walk over next. Is that a quarter? Oh, that's a hundred dollar bill, baby. Go over and pick that up. Downtown Nashville. No, no, no. My wife, she won't even think. She'll, she'll get to walking. I'll be like, I push her over. Yeah, she's seen it. I grab by her and say, uh-uh, no. You let that car run over me. Be all fine. Be all right, right? I'll go down. My wife know I love her. Be the savior of the body. People go, oh, I love my wife. I'd die for my wife. Have you ever opened the door for her in the last year? Hmm? Now, I, I don't watch your marriage, and so I don't know, and I'm not trying to say that I'm the patternistic person for marriage, but, uh, you know, it's interesting. We talk about how much we love our wives, and they open every door. They're the ones that pull out the credit card for every meal, Right? <laughs> I'm just saying. You see... It's more than just saying, oh, I'll take a bullet. Anybody can say that. I got people all over the world say they'd take a bullet for me, and they'd pull the trigger in two seconds flat if they had to. I got people like, oh, we're never going to leave the church. We love you. We would jump in front of a locomotive. They laughed six months ago, and they would push me in front of one and mash the gas and run over me right now. Words mean nothing to your spouse, sir. Words mean nothing to your spouse, and, and vice versa, the other way around, right? Uh, we're trying to be balanced here. He's the savior of the body. But but watch this. We're going to get even more practical than that. Verse 24. Therefore, because of this fact, because Jesus is the Savior of the body, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. Now watch what he's going to do. He's going to go back and say the same thing in some way. So let the wives be to their own. Shout own. 
not somebody else's. Okay, the quickest way you will ever build a lack of trust and loyalty in your marriage, ladies, is for you to listen to other men over your husband. I don't care if he's your favorite YouTube preacher. I don't care how much you like my preaching. I don't care how great your boss is. And I don't care how, how smooth he is. No, no, no. I'm telling you, if you obey the voice of another man over your husband, no wonder he's mad. No wonder he's angry, right? Your own husbands. Now watch this. These three words right here are going to get you. In everything. Boy, that's, 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 that's tight. No wonder we skip over it. Did you have to translate that, Paul? In everything. Now, he's just twice given us the foundation that everything has nothing to do with anything that's sinful. So if it's not sinful, in everything, the Bible says you reverence the headship of your husband. Now look, I know that is not popular. I'm, I'm trying to salvage your home. Not write another best-selling book about it. Right? And there's a lot of books on marriage that won't touch stuff like this. They want to talk about communicate. Listen, you can't even begin to communicate correctly until a wife and a husband both understand what mutual submission looks like. You see, a, a woman is, is magnetic. She reciprocates. Well, this woman better submit to me. Then you better love her and give her a reason to. She wants to submit. If you love her correctly, like Jesus, biblically, the way a Holy Spirit in filling will allow you and make you do that. So in everything. So whatever that looks like in your family, Okay. Well, we, we've, got a, we've got a lot of things that could be said about the phrase in everything. Financially, romantically, a lot of things. Now, I'm not going to steal the thunder because the ladies have been talking about the whole intimacy context. And, and, and Pastor Jesse has a whole message in which I'm about to give him a, a Wednesday night to talk about what God taught him in a difficult time in their marriage, in a vulnerable time, about the, the, the pureness and the purpose and the biblical obedience of true intimacy. You ever wonder why there's a whole book in the Bible, eight chapters called the Song of Solomon, that's all about a man's sex life with his wife? Marriage is honorable at all, and the bed is undefiled. And I'm going to say a couple of things here about this, right? Because we read this kind of stuff, we're like, yeah, I knew he's going to get on that. Right? I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. If you're bitter about it, you ought to get right with God. You hear me? If you're grumpy about it right now, fix your face. Because God's trying to fix your heart. Do you know in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul, under Holy Ghost inspiration and revelation, said, the only reason you two, husband and wife, don't come together for sexual union, fellowship, and pleasure is that both of you have agreed to it so that you can fast and pray. I hear these marriages, they're like, well, you know, we just got this mutual agreement. You know, we just... We're just, we're just not romantic. You're unbiblical. No wonder your husband's addicted to pornography. And by the way, no wonder a lot of women are addicted to pornography. We always give the men a rough road for it, but there's as many women that are addicted to pornographic nonsense, reading them romance novels. No wonder you can't love your husband. You watching soap operas and loving everybody else's. Oh, it's Wednesday night. Bring the fire, Lord. Take a drink on that. <laughs> Got to lather up what comes next, right? That's the only reason in the Bible. So look, the more Bible I read, the more I recognize the importance of mutual submission and obedience in the area of intimacy. You ever thought, and again, I'm not going to get out ahead of them. You ever thought about the definition, the real you ever thought about the real biblical idea of intimacy? You know what the word is? In to me 
see. See, there's only one person that gets full access to me, and it's her. Intimacy is when you are seeing into the other. They're seeing, you are bearing your soul. Because I'm going to tell you something. Marriage is a biblical soul tie. Sex outside of marriage is an unbiblical curse because you are soul tied to the person you slept with that you ain't married to. It's facts. Deliverance ministry 101 right there. Right? And the Bible teaches so extraordinarily that a man and a woman are to be passionately in love. I don't care if you are in your 20s or your 90s. Right? I don't care. Stop giving lame excuses. I'm just going to be PG-13. Stop giving lame excuses for why you don't have sex in your marriage. It's lame. It's unbiblical. You say, well, uh, I'm single. Well, I ain't preaching to you because you shouldn't be having sex know-how. Right? And if you shacked up having sex, then this Sunday you need to come down and repent. And I'm going to marry you on the spot so you can go home and have right sex. Right? Well, you know, Pastor, I don't think you ought to preach like that. I don't think you ought to come back because I think preaching like that changes people's lives. Yeah. Preachers don't want to talk about this stuff. Well, you know, we don't want to talk about intimacy. God wrote a whole book in the Bible on it. And, and I wouldn't even, listen, I would not, I promise you, I would not expositionally preach the book of Song of Solomon unless it was a whole group of nothing but married people. I wouldn't even preach Song of Solomon. Not that it's not the Word of God. I wouldn't even preach Song of Solomon to want to be married people. I mean, it is thick with some crazy romance. I mean, some. it goes, it's elevated beyond some PG-13 stuff. You start reading the context. But it's in the Bible. And everybody's like, well, I just don't think you ought to talk about it. I think you ought to read the Bible. One good time, once in your life. Five minutes, all it takes. God says a lot about it. So look, I'm going to make a statement. I know uh, people are going to leave the church. People are going to be mad. People are not going to come back. People are going to get upset. Don't stand in line. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> Listen, I get it's two-way street. I get it. I get it. I get it. I know men have different desires and different needs. I get all of that. I understand it. Okay, there, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's a reason that men and women are unbelievably different in the way that we think, and thank God for that. But I'm going to say something, and I don't care if you amen or not. Okay, I don't care if you clap. I don't care if you throw a chair. And men, by the way, don't shout and scream amen what I'm about to say, okay? Just don't. Because it won't help anything. Because I'm just, I'm, I'm righting some wrongs tonight. Ladies, can I love you enough as your friend and your shepherd to tell you something biblically? <laughs> If you're one of these ladies that uses sex as a weapon or as a reward, you're using it wrong. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you and your husband are one of these couples, I'm just pastoring you tonight. It's like, well, you know, we, we come together like once a month. Some of the guys in here are like, once a month? Well, that's a lot. <laughs> Some of you guys are like, I wish. Look, if that's you, I'm going to tell you something, lady. In your heart right now, you ought to seek forgiveness and get right with God. I don't care if you clap or not. There's no such monster in the Bible. There is no such monster in the Bible. Holy Spirit-filled marriages are joyously intimate. And I get sometimes there's quagmire that keeps relationships from going the direction they should. That's why we got deliverance. Okay, we, we can see you get deliverance from things that happen in your past that keep you from being able to move forward. I got it. I get it. We'll counsel you. We'll help you. But if you're one of these people that uses intimacy as a weapon for your husband, I'm here to tell you something he won't tell you. He is miserable. He is lonely. He is isolated. 
He is constantly angry. The Bible says two times that a man should not be bitter at his wife. Why would God tell me not to be bitter at the woman I'm supposed to love more than life itself? Because you forced him into a corner of bitterness by depriving him of something that God built him for. Right? So listen. Again, 1 Corinthians 7. The husband's body belongs to the wife. The wife's body belongs to the husband. That's, where, that's why pornography is such an affront to spirituality. Because you're looking at something you don't own. You, you're looking at something that doesn't belong to you. So you get all like shut off and shut down and all you do is give a cold shoulder and pull the covers over and roll over. Better luck next time. You need to pray. You need to get your heart right with God. I don't care how mad you get. I don't care if five people show back up on Sunday. Some of you men need to quit being so mealy mouth and actually tell your wife how you feel about this kind of stuff. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk about sex. That's why you don't never have none. Dear God in heaven, I wasn't going this route, but y'all about to. Am I right? Marriages are plagued by a lack of romance. Plagued by it. No intimacy, no romance. Listen, if, if nothing else, start with date night once a week. People are like, well, you know, man, it's been a long time since I dated my wife. Well, sir, you ought to get right with God then. I, I, I don't care where you take her to McDonald's. I don't care where you take her. But go out, talk, walk. Pray, express things you like, and express things you don't like. You know one of the best things you can do is go on what I call a communication drive? You know what that is? That's both y'all getting in the car. Each one of you get like 30 minutes, and the other one can't talk, can't respond, and can't give a rebuttal, and can't defend themselves. Because you know what I found driving down the road? I can say things to the windshield that I won't look at her and say to her face. <laughs> and tell you something right now, like... Turn, 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 turn. She's like, been 30 minutes. Okay, your turn. Go on a communication drive. Y'all got to talk. Y'all got to talk stuff out. You see, you don't have money problems. You don't have kid problems. You don't have sex problems. You don't have in-law. Well, you might have that one. Problems. You have communication problems. You got to talk. You know what's crazy? When y'all were dating, y'all talk on the phone so long you'd fall asleep and the battery would die. I don't even like talking on the phone. So why is it to win him, to win her, you talk, 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 you get married and you shut up. Well, I told her I loved her a few years ago. If I ever changed my mind, I'll let her know. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Tell her till she gets tired of it. I, you know that little, that little, little bitty whatever that dog was on like Tom and Jerry that followed around that big dog. Hey, 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 hey. Listen, I'm telling you right now. That's why I am at my house. Hey, baby, I love you. Hey, baby, I love you. Hey, you didn't tell me you love me. Hey, baby, I love. That's just the way I am. You say I don't like that. I don't care. I got a happy marriage. It's rocking on. I'm telling you, you fall in love and stay there. Quit looking for every reason to be driven apart and look for every reason to come back together again. Go on a vacation for a day, a night. I don't, go book a room somewhere. Do something. Go crazy. I don't care what you do. But dear God, do something. You got let Let it be a last-ditch effort. Well, if I bring it up, she's going to be mad. Well, if she's still mad after this service... Then first Sunday night of the month, <laughs> she got some blockage in there somewhere. We got to deliver that chick, right? So don't go home acting all big and bad, okay? Now go home lording over. Don't go home dress up like Batman, climb up on the dresser and, whoo, you hear the preacher? 
Ease into it, boys. Ease into it. <laughs> but y'all got to figure something else out. Because this depriving each other ain't working. And I'm going to tell you what, listen, I'm talking for your husbands tonight, and I ain't talked to none of them. I'm telling you, he's about to blow his gasket. He's about to blow his gasket. Because you know what he does every day? I don't even care what time it is. Listen. Let me tell you something about your husband. I'm helping people online, too. Y'all there? Say amen. I don't care how juvenile you think he is. I don't care how many times you ramrod him with that stupid, unbiblical, is that all you ever think about? Let me tell you something. Probably. Because that's the way God geared him. You might as well get over. That's the way God made him. Quit trying to change him. You knew who he was when you married him. Right? So listen. Your husband. Can I talk for you guys? Your husband, he go to work. He's like, man, I can't wait till I get home. The might might be tonight. He'd be on a golf course thinking about it. I'd be out preaching thinking about it. I'm telling you facts. Right? Come on. I ain't got nothing to hide. Praise God, we ain't fasting. I ain't got nothing to hide. I ain't worried about it. <laughs> I'll let you know when I ain't eating food, praise God. I ain't scared of none of you. <laughs> but I'm saying, this guy is trying to figure out how to bring it up. And he shouldn't have to. You should bring it up. You should talk about it. You say, I don't like it. Well, take it up with God, not your husband. Because I done told you what the Bible said about it. In, in, in many places. Everybody okay? Yeah. Praise God in heaven. I do love y'all. So we'll, we'll deal with that in a whole group time together when we talk. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure we do an expositional journey through Song of Solomon, but only with married folk. And no live stream on that. Amen. <laughs> That'd go viral. <laughs> All right, verse 25. Husbands. Shout husbands. Oh, he doesn't got to us now, right? And we've been talking about us the whole time, but husbands, love your wives. And let me remind you, that command comes on the heels of her in submission, but they're directly connected. She'll never want to really submit until you really want to love her. Husbands, love your wives, even as, notice that, even as, underline that, it's the most important phrase in the whole, in the whole verse, really. It's the connecting bridge. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus gave his life for the church. By the way, let me just say this. For some of you, maybe you've been through a bad marriage, you've been divorced, you, you're separated now, or, you, or, you're, or you're single, and you want to get married, or you're dating somebody, then look, then let all of this be pre preventative maintenance, right? Let all this be, okay, this is what I want to look for. Because look, I'm going to tell you something. If you are dating somebody right now, man or woman, that already at this moment has no respect for you, you wait till you marry that bum. Listen, if you are already, sir, if, if you are already dating, courting, whatever you want to call it, somebody, that rolls their eyes at you on a regular basis. <laughs> Wait till you get married. Start walking around in a shower towel. Hmm? See what she thinks about you then. <laughs> if she can't stand you with your clothes on. I showed up to pastor tonight, amen. Some of y'all need to get this figured out. Let me tell you, the last thing you want to do is marry the wrong person. Now, by the grace of God, he can part the Red Sea and make them the right person. But when you marry the wrong person, when you sow to the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. And it ain't no fun. It's a miserable existence. 
And listen, sad to say, 80%, I don't know what the percentage is, I'm just going to say 80. Shout 80. That's my number. 80% of couples that are married are lonely. Hmm? That's why they're flirting with their boss. Hmm? That's why he's stoved up in a hotel room while he's traveling around doing work. He can't sleep and the devil knows it. And let me tell you what him and the devil both know. What's on HBO and sin to the max and rest that stuff at 2 o'clock in the morning. Hmm? Skin a max. Hmm? I'm just telling you. Most marriages are filled with lonely people. That's such a shame. God never intended for it to be that way. It just, it's just a shame. So thank God if you have a marriage where you're working on these things. But the Bible says you are to love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. But then watch this. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You know, everybody's like, well, you know, First Corinthians says a woman ought to keep her mouth shut in church and a woman shouldn't talk. Well, what you ought to do is get some context to that. It was talking about headship. It wasn't talking about women that can't do nothing. Everybody's like, well, you know, First Timothy said that a woman can't usurp authority over a man. So therefore, when a woman preaches, she's usurping authority. Not if I gave it to her. She can't usurp what I gave her. Well, if you give a woman a microphone, then you, you need to read a Bible. Oh, no, Skippy, you need to read a Bible. You know why Paul said a woman ought to keep silent in the church? You know why he said that it's confusing, 1 Corinthians 14, 33? Because in that day, you do understand that headship was a big deal. But here's what was happening. Did you know even to this day in the Middle East, there are still churches where men sit on one side and women sit on the other? To this day. There are, I've, I've been in American congregations where they still have the old-fashioned 1800s divider. Women sit on one side, men sit on the other. So what would happen is these women would want to know something about the Bible. So when somebody's teaching in the Bible, they'd just blurt out or they'd raise their hand and they'd start talking and Paul said, whoa, wait. Don't speak out at church, but if she will learn anything, let her ask her husband at home. He's not saying she can't speak. He's saying she can't take over because taking over would steal headship from the guy that's supposed to be in charge of her to begin with. So let me tell you something. That might sound brutal to the ladies, but let's get brutal to the boys. If the Bible says that she is to come home and ask you a question, let me tell you something that that means. When a man comes to me and says, well, i tell you what, Brother Locke. Man, my wife. She's so dadgum unspiritual. That is not a reflection of her. That's a reflection of you. Because you are to personally disciple your wife in the washing of the water of the Word of God. You are to personally disciple her. So if you're single and dating somebody that don't like the Bible, don't like church, don't like prayer, you better run while you can. You better get out right now. Because you're going to be calling me in about five years. And you're going to be like, I heard that message. But I just thought you was making stuff up. And I'm in a real mess. Well, you ain't got to be in a real mess. Mary Wright, obey the Lord. Watch this, verse 27. We got to quit. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. I love that. You see, he's using an analogy of how Jesus treats the church for our husband's supposed to preach a wife, treat, you know, treat his wife. Present it a glorious church. You see, a husband that properly serves his wife is presenting her well. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that you got to, you know, spend every single amount of money in the whole wide world just to make her happy. Money's not going to make her happy no how. If you love your wife, she can put up with being broke and she'll put up with your dad bod till I can get you a bicycle, okay? But listen, the Bible plainly says that Jesus wants to present the church a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Do you know what one of your number one responsibilities, husbands, should be to your wife? To treat her in such a way that she wants to live holy for Jesus. 
You represent Jesus to her so much that she can't help but fall more in love with Jesus than she is in love with you. Because if she will love Jesus more than she loves you, she will love you a whole lot more than she loves anybody else. And the only way I can love her like Christ loved the church is to love him above her. And when I love him above her, I will naturally love her more than the average so-called Christian husband loves his wife. Most marriages tolerate each other. I'm just putting up with him. Okay, that's a, that's a horrible, that's a hellish way to live. He said, well, you don't know that. I don't have to because I'm going to tell you something. Marriage is a union of two good forgivers. You know, the, the best thing you'll do is get over stuff, and the worst thing you'll do is keep bringing up stuff. You remember when you, uh, God don't do that to you. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from it. If God don't bring it up, you stop bringing it up. Stop bringing it up. So there's a way, fellas, that you, you serve your wife. You present her well. You bless her. You honor her. Now watch this, verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. I am to love my wife as I love my own body. Why would he say that? Because we serve our bodies. We feed ourselves. We clothe ourselves. We bathe ourselves. Right? We, we pamper ourselves. If we like bicycling, we buy bicycles. If we like hunting, we buy hunting stuff. If we like fishing, we buy boats and fishing stuff. Right? We serve ourselves. We love ourselves. We pamper ourselves. And here's what God said. Love your wife like you love your own body. You see, he doesn't even tell me to love my wife more than myself. He tells me in a moment to love my wife as myself. If I would just love my wife as much as I love me, holy smokes, what a marriage I would have. You see, we pamper ourselves. Why don't we pamper them? I, I know society, and I, I know the poverty spirit has convinced the, convinced the broke church mentality. Well, you know, fellas, that's just a waste of money. You ought not spend that on your wife. Why not? Jesus died for his church. You can't buy her an expensive ring that she's been wanting for a while. Save up for it. I ain't got the money. The Bible says a man don't work, he don't eat. So just save up for it. Hit your buddies up for it. Take a loan. Can't buy your wife flowers? Listen, about a mile and a half from here is a cemetery. You know, they swap them things out like every week or two. <laughs> Slip up in their own swapping out day. Be like, hey, uh, Judd Sellers, can I have some of them flowers? I got to get to the house, praise God. I'm just saying, where there's a wheel, there's a way, <laughs> amen. Pamper her, dote on her, serve her, wash her feet, not just because you've got a man plan, but because that's God's plan. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth who? Himself. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Verse 29, I got to quit. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. You ever heard somebody say, I just hate myself. You a lie, you a whole lie. You know why you said that? Because you love yourself and want attention. I just hate myself. No, God said no man ever yet hated himself. So you lied just so you could get attention to make people think you hate yourself. And you said it because you love yourself. You're in self-preservation mode, right? You're in self-preservation mode. So he said, listen, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. Nourish her, cherish her, pamper her, spoil her, bless her, honor her. That's what the Bible says. And by the way, you don't do it for the return either because you don't use that as a weapon or reward in the same way that I told her not to use intimacy for that. You do it because it's the right thing to do. You do it because you want to. Figure out what she likes. The best thing you will ever do, guys, is when you are in full-blown communication, pay attention to little silly things she tells her friends. Just pay attention. Like, man, I heard her say this. And just show up with it. Now, I'll be honest. I've listened for so long, I about run out of things that she liked growing up. I, honestly, I know it's 831. Help me, Lord. Listen, I, and I'm not, I'm not tooting my own horn. You know what I think about that. But she's right here. You can talk to her at church. I don't know if there's a thing I've ever heard her mention in conversation that she grew up liking 
that I didn't find on the internet and buy it. Yeah, a baby. I heard her talking about a baby doll one day. This little silly thing called baby beans. It wasn't a beanie baby. It was a baby full of beans. It was like old-fashioned, way back in the day, you know, Noah's Ark type stuff, right? And so <laughs> she said, when I was a little bitty, I had this thing called baby beans, and it, it, got, it got burnt up in a house. Got burnt up in a house, right? And I heard her talk about baby beans. I called Maria, her sister. I was like, Maria, you remember baby beans? I was like, if I found a picture of it on the Internet, do you think you'd know what it looked like? I started scouring the internet for some stupid thing called baby beans. That was just the name of it. It wasn't even the, the, what it was, right? I finally found it. I, I sent her like 50 pictures. She's like, oh, that, that looks just like what baby beans would have looked like. So I found some cat on eBay in England that had a pink baby beans. Ugliest little doll you have ever laid your eyes on. But I bid and fought and bid and fought and bid and fought and bid and fought. And when I lost the bid, I bid more. And I bought baby beans. We went on a date one night and I said, hey, baby, you ain't going to believe what I got in this box right here. <laughs> I felt like Fabio. <laughs> she opened it up. She's like, baby beans. But we've done all kinds of stuff like that. I say, we, I, I, I listen. Again, I'm just, I, I'm just speaking from a pastoral standpoint because I want you to know that I'm trying to be an example. I still listen, right? Now, I'll be honest. I've been real bad lately about flowers. Yeah. So I bought some yesterday <laughs> and brought them home. And I'm like, man, I've been bad. Man, I was used to buying flowers all the time. A couple months ago, she said something one day. She said, I just thought today when I was at the grocery store, I was going to buy myself some flowers since you ain't bought me none. I went out and bought like three different bouquets for three different rooms. Put some in the bathroom. Put some in the bedroom. Put some in the closet, baby. Woo, praise God. Here's a whole, I bought you a jungle. <laughs> you see, too much ain't too much. If you listen, find out what she loves, find out what she likes. I could tell you her favorite candy. I could tell you her favorite drink. I could tell you her favorite color. I could tell you her favorite clothes. I could tell you the size of them little Hot Wheel shoes that she wears. Praise God, I could tell you all of it. I could walk into a... My wife and I will walk into a store, one of her like little, little, little foo-foo girly stores, you know. I can walk into a store, that white lily down here, got all them cute little clothes. And all. I could walk in a store. I could get a bag and I could de-rack the clothes and know exactly what she would wear. And come home, she'd be like, oh, that's nice. Oh, I love that. Oh, that, yeah. oh, that's right size, baby. You did good, right? Listen, guys. Listen to her. You know, the Bible says in First Peter that you dwell with them, get this, according to knowledge. Even Peter, under inspiration, said they're hard to get to know. That's what he said. Dwell with them according to knowledge. What that means is you better study her because you ain't learnt her yet. She's a big, long book. Encyclopedia Britannica ain't got nothing on your wife. You just got through volume one. You halfway through the A's. Listen to her. Learn her. Find out what she likes. Find out what she don't. There's things I used to do for a couple times, and I found out, ah, she didn't like that. She ain't never got it again. Never got it again. And by the way, once we got in deliverance ministry, she came to me one day. She said, honey, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I don't know. There's something crazy about this baby beans. I said, burn that sucker right now. That's the ugliest doll I've ever looked. Burn that demon right now in the name of God. So baby beans died in the fire twice. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> They won't be a third time, praise God. Little warlock. <laughs> Hallelujah. Whew, we got to quit. <laughs> I, I like a church that likes the Bible. Amen. Verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Okay? You can honor them. You can respect them, but keep them out of your marriage. 
You ever heard somebody say, well, you know, this is two families coming together as one big family. That's the dumbest thing you've ever heard. You a brand new family coming out of two other families. You starting your own. You ain't bringing them together. Absolutely not. You ain't bringing them. You starting your own marriage. Best thing you can do, keep your family out. That's not easy. It's not easy. Especially when you're close to your kids, right? They'd be calling, be saying this. I'm like, mm-mm. Mm-mm. You deal with him, you deal with her, you deal with y'all, y'all deal with Jesus. I'm out. You deeply need me? Fine. You want a gripe? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Don't even text me a gripe. I ain't fooling with it. You better figure this out. You better figure this out. Bible says you forsake father and mother. That don't mean you, you hate them. It means the respectable thing to do is a man and a woman cleave together. That's what the Bible says they do. And shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. You ever notice that when we marry folks, a lot of times traditionally we'll say things like this. I now present to you Mr. and Mrs., and we call the man's name. You know why? Because the Bible says in Matthew 18, but it's a cross-reference to obviously Genesis chapter 2. The Bible says, and he made them male and female, and he called their name Adam. God did not name Eve. Adam did. And unto his wife, he gave the name Eve, comma, because she was the mother of all living. God did not name her Eve. God named her Adam. Because they two shall be one flesh. It's the same reason the devil killed everybody in Job's family except Job's wife. Because when God said, you can't kill Job, the devil knew that means you can't kill Miss Job. Because they two shall be one flesh. That's what the Bible says. They're one flesh. That's that union. Verse 32, and here's why we can't understand it. This is a great mystery. If Paul said it's confusing, it's confusing. If Paul said it's a mystery, it's a mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. You see, a godly marriage is the most beautiful picture of the gospel in the whole world. That's what the Bible teaches. Nevertheless... Let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as. Notice, not more than. It's just like love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because God knows you love yourself so much. If you just love her as much as you love you, wow. <laughs> You'd have a rock solid home life. Even as himself. Now watch this. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now look. We joke around sometimes at the house. Well, you know, old Sarah said, called Abraham Lord. You know, Hebrews 11. And we can joke around about stuff like that. But listen, I'm, I'm going to be honest. And I know it's a two-way street. But he ain't talking about the man to the woman. He's talking about the woman to the man. You see, really the only thing she wants is just for you to listen, for you to love her, and just be there. Like, be present when you're present. Like, be there when you're there. That's all she wants. But do you know how to make that an absolute practical and biblical reality? Respect your husband. See that she reverence. Her. Listen, that don't mean... Like, stop. Stop. Now, if you want to do that, whatever. Okay, that's on you. That's silly. Reverence her husband. That really means two things. It means a hundred things, but I've only got time to tell you this. Real reverence is twofold. How you treat him in his presence and how you treat him when he's not there in everybody else's presence. Listen, you don't always have to agree with your husband on stuff, and you won't. But if you run him down around your girlfriends, you're on a path to marital destruction. And I'll go one step further. If you run him down in front of other men, you're on a path to adultery. Thousand percent. You're on a path to adultery. Because he's just looking for a weak link. Hmm? He, he, he's just looking for you to be like, yeah, I tell you, my husband just don't love me, and my husband this, my husband that. And he's going to swoop in and try to be Tarzan. And that unspiritual joke will going to ruin your marriage. And you're going to let him because you didn't reverence your husband. I'm sorry. I know this ain't popular, but I don't care. 
I got over trying to build a huge crowd a long time ago. I find out our church does better when people leave. That's facts. Gideon defeated the Midianites with 300. Not 32,000. 32,000 is fun, but I'll take 300 people that got a rock-solid marriage and want to serve Jesus and learn how to fast and pray and cast out demons and lay hands on the sick and they should. Hey, I'll take that any day of the week. I'm just saying, if you don't reverence your husband, you are, you are setting your marriage up for failure. Stop always having to be right, ladies. Because we already know you are. You really are. But you ain't got to keep telling us. It's disrespectful. Let the man make a decision that sometimes blows up in his face. It's like I tell the staff. If, if I lead us to a bad place, we all own it and I'll lead us out of the bad place. Let your husband do that. Let him wake up with egg on his face every night again. Like, oh, honey, you were right. Let him tell you you were right, not you have to tell him every five seconds. He already knows. He already feels super insecure because you are way smarter than him. Way smarter. That's the facts. I don't care if he's a PhD, if he's a rocket scientist. You're way smarter than he is. That's just the way God set things up. She's got way more discernment. She's got way more cooth. She's got way more coolness. She's got way more MVP in her than I do, right? She just does. But she respects me. And I tell you what, she ain't never done. She has never talked down about me or to me in front of them youngins. You setting you and your kids up for marital failure if you run your husband down in front of them kids, in front of them grandkids. When we got a uh, when we got something that you know we got a we got to hash out, we got to talk. We're either gonna close the door and turn the fan on so they can't hear us mad. Oh, we're going to get in the car and talk to the windshield. But we're going to talk it out. But she's not going to disrespect me. I, I never have to ask my wife, oh, man, you, you know, went out with the staff. You know, went out with them girls. You know, went out with people at the church. You know, went out with some ladies in the church. What, 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 what are y'all talking about? I don't care what they talk about because I can promise you, my wife has never downgraded me with her friends with, behind my back. Never. Never one time. I guarantee she never has. She might say, he's crazy. But, I mean, that's different, right? Because I am that. <laughs> Woo, I am that. And I come home with some wild stuff. I mean, some of you, some of you ladies need to thank God. It's easier to reverence your husband than it would be to reverence me. I come home with some wild dreams and visions, and God, I'm like, baby, you ain't gonna believe what the Holy Ghost done told me. She's like, what is it, dear? I, I know it's 845. I'm just at, at this point, I'm just preaching and teaching and laughing and whatever. But it's really, and I'll talk some about this uh, when we have our generosity gathering. But you know one of the reasons I'm able to be a big giver? Because my wife don't nag me about it. You know, there are times that I'm just like, you know what? The Lord gave me a good, uh, you know, love offering. Or the Lord, you know, blessed me with the book doing super well. And people just think we're just sitting around on gobs of money. No. We give it to the Lord's work. About every bit of it. About every bit of it. And there's been times that I have written checks or received cash or whatever, you know, books or whatever. And I ask the people that count. I ain't got nothing to hide. You can look at my giving record anytime you want to. I ain't lying about nothing. Right? And there are times I've been like, you know what? I'm just going to stroke the whole thing. I'm like, man, that's the biggest love offering I've ever got in my whole life. That's a lot of people. That's a big whew, that's a big book signing deal right there. Global Vision, Bible Church, <laughs> extra zero. And not one time have I ever went home with it behind my back like, uh, baby. Mm -mm. I'll give it, tell her two days later when it clears the bank. And she does all the banking, so she sees it before I do. And that one time she, oh, I can't believe you gave that much. Uh -uh. Some of you ladies that want your husband to step out in faith, if you reverenced his faith, he'd step out in it. Let him, let him do what God called him to do. Is he going to mess it up? Probably. Not every time. But respect him. Don't roll your eyes when he walks in the house. 
throw your arms out when he walks in the house. Give that man a reason to think about you all day when he's around a bunch of crazy people driving him nuts. And when he walks through that door, all it takes is a little respect. He feels like a loser. He feels like, man, I'm getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm working my fingers to the bone. Nothing's happening. He could be broke as a joke. Y'all could have no money in the bank. He'd be working three jobs trying to figure it all out. But if when he came home from work every day, if all you did was let him know how much you appreciate him, He'd find a way to make it work, and he'd never complain about it. And I mean, he'd put a pep in his step. He'd put some zeal in him. And I mean, he'd wake up with some spiritual spirits of ringtone. He'd burn the world down because all he wants is a woman that reverences him, that appreciates him for who he is, not just what he can do. Because I'm going to tell you something. You appreciate that man and love him for who he is, he'll do it. He'll move heaven and earth and fight hell with a squirt pistol for you. Yeah, Absolutely. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, that she could ever ask me for that I would not move heaven and earth to make sure she gets. I got back out on my bicycle today. I love my bicycles. Let me tell you something. I'd sell every bicycle I have before 9.30 tonight if my wife wanted and needed something that I couldn't provide in the moment and she needed it. I'd sell everything I got and I'd make sure she got it. Make sure of it. Men, love her, serve her, honor her, teach her, understand her, pray for her and with her, date her, sacrifice for her. And you know what will happen? What the Bible says will happen. You'll both be filled with the Holy Ghost. Your marriage will be filled with peace, love, joy, harmony, not perfection. Holy smokes, we're not looking for perfect marriages. We're looking for biblical marriages. It's how some of you have hung on for years and years and years. Some of y'all been married about as long as I've been preaching or alive. Well, how do you stay with the same person? Love, reverence. Love, reverence. Love, reverence. You see, sir, she just wants love. And you see, ma'am, he just wants respect. And you pull them two things together in a marriage, and I'm telling you, you better look out, devil. You better look out, devil. And even some of y'all could be in a very shaky, quaky, rocky place right now in your marriage. Let this tonight be medicine that may go down a little painfully. But you'll wake up tomorrow and you'll feel a little bit better about it because the Word of God tells us if you get Holy Ghost filled, if she gets Holy Ghost filled, if you are both Holy Ghost filled, then what's going to happen is you're going to have a marriage that's abundantly blessed by God. Abundantly blessed by God. Nobody said it was easy. But it is possible. It is possible. Lord... I didn't intend to go this long tonight, but I thank you for a church family and people in-house and online that they just, they just take it. That's some crazy hard stuff to talk about. Lord, in, in actuality and in, in practical honesty, that, that, that stuff's harder to deal with than any of the political stuff. Nobody wants to talk about submission and reverence and headship. And because we don't want to talk about it, we have a 75% divorce rate in the church world. And then people that are married and lonely in their own house, in their own bedroom. So Lord, I, I pray that you would just baptize our church in godly marriages. Lord, show us men where we have erred that we may repent, pick up the baton, and serve our wives. Father, show the wives where they've erred, where they need to repent, and how they can better serve and reverence their husband. Lord, help us to put up guardrails. Help us to be open and accountable, honest, 
humble with each other. And may every husband and every wife in this room honor their partner deeply. And then for those that are looking to get married or want to be eventually married, Lord, I pray that they would understand that from the heart of a pastor and a friend and from the heart of the scriptures, Lord, here's what the Bible says. Here's the recipe. And they may have had a fall down the steps experience already in a marriage. But somebody in this room and somebody online needs to know they're not done. They're not finished. They may be down, but they are not out. The bell is not rung. And Lord, I pray you'd raise them up. Give them an opportunity once again to be the man and woman of God in a marriage that you've called them to be. Thank you, Jesus, for grace. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for a church that's willing to hear and obey the hard stuff. Lord, we love you. And because we love you, may we deeply love each other. Set our homes on fire, we pray, in the name of Jesus. And the church said, stand with me all over the room. Thank you for listening. I know it's almost 9 o'clock. You've listened so well. I really, I was going to go for like 20 minutes and be done. But when y'all amen and laugh, it just keeps me going. I can't help myself. I love all of you. Be back this weekend. Listen, Friday night, 9 o'clock, 24 hours of prayer, 6 o'clock, GV Espanol one-year celebration. Come celebrate with us. I'll be preaching. It's going to be a beautiful time. You're not going to want to miss it. We'll hear about the Honduras trip they just took. We have video footage of them literally finding lame people laying on the street, could not stand, demonized. I watched them on a video cast a demon out of a man, and that he was healed instantly, and he was able to stand up. Unbelievable. We're going to talk about some of those things this Saturday night. Don't miss out, and we'll see you also Sunday morning at 1030. I love you guys. Thanks for being here. Get around. Hug each other. Love each other. You are dismissed.